When I watch you, it's as if you invest that piece of wood and ceramics or whatever it is, you invest it with a life and it actually comes to life when it works. How did you learn how to do that? <laughs> I mean, hmm. do they teach that at puppetry conventions? I mean, no, what? they don't. How uh, do you... I, I was really well trained by a couple of old mentors how to build a really good puppet. Uh, I think that's the first thing. The instrument has to be good. And I think that's downplayed a lot these days. There's a lot of people doing puppetry, but they don't invest time in making the instrument good. So it'd be like, you know, saying to Yo-Yo Ma, here's a wash tub fiddle or wash tub bass. Make the same music that you get out of a great right. cello, you know. I'm sure he could make music on a wash tub uh, bass. But at the other end of the scale, and because puppetry was always part of childhood, yes, it's what we saw, we enjoyed as child, whatever. When it moved into the adult world for me, before I'd seen any of your shows, I watched a, a puppeteer who, um, he used his knee as the face, he had, the pant was up. Hugo he had, and Inez. And he had two hands yeah. and they played the guitar and he had a red nose on, a, on an elastic. Yeah. And it was about busking for money. And I'm watching and going, oh, yes. I think it was at the, the Milk Festival yeah. here. And I'm saying, oh, how nice. Uh, children's theater, nice, nice, nice. But then the knee became real. And the artifice was all there because you saw his face above. Mm -hmm. And when the story went and the knee committed suicide because someone was stealing the money, I was hit emotionally in a way I never expected to be hit. Yeah. And I thought, what is going on here? That I, the knee came to life. And I know it's a knee. There's no fooling here. And that's what you do. What is that? That's, you know, that's the same thing as a, a singer that, that makes you feel something from lyrics. That's the same thing as a clown that can do something that seems stock but makes you feel an emotion or a really good actor. I, I don't know what that thing is, but I think it is about uh, personal artistry regardless of the instrument or the medium. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of people who make really nice marionettes. And I feel nothing watching their work. Nothing other than, oh, that's interesting, and that's great skill, or the mm -hmm. manipulation is beautiful. But in terms of diving into it emotionally, that's so rare, even for me, watching contemporary puppetry. So I think that is just about the performer. Um, and and their will and their um, take on humanity, right? Because what is art? There's the bigger question. And, and my mentor, Martin Stevens, gave me the best definition of art when I was 12 years old. A, a funny story, he actually said to me, what's your definition of art? <laughs> I looked at him and said, I'm 12. I don't have one. And he said, you can borrow mine until you come up with yours. And his definition of art was, art is the personal contribution to the ever-continuing conversation about life. And that's a beauty. You know, it's just, it, it takes the heat off of you of trying to be uh, the great spokesman and say, this is everything to everyone. It's just my personal contribution to the conversation. So every time I do a show, it's me saying, here's what I think of us right now. But not to dull this point to death, there is an invocation of something that appears on stage mm -hmm. when someone can do it, like mm -hmm. you or the knee. Something is invoked that was not there before. And as you say, if, if it's all technically good but it's empty, you don't feel anything. Yeah. But in those, because it is magic and metaphor wound together. It is the metaphor of something created. We see the artifice and yet the metaphor itself is telling us something about life and the conversation. And it is that moment of magic when the metaphor drops away and the reali a reality of a knee or a face comes to life. I, I think part of that is, uh, you know, you're speaking of Hugo and Inez, who are a South American team with the nose on the knee, who are sublime. But they are also so physically proficient that there's no awkwardness in the performance of that. So technically, they got all of that figured out and out of the way and rehearsed before they put it in front of an audience. And, you know, I, I spent a lot of time building this stuff, that every knee joint and every neck joint does what I need it to do, and, and uh, 
the controls and all of that other stuff are very specific. So for me, it's about getting your technical chops honed really well um, so that you can fly above technique. And, but that's how I was trained that you had to have a bedrock of technique. You had to have a bedrock of vocal technique, so if you have a cold or the flu or laryngitis, you still know how to hit the back wall. Um, and in terms of manipulation, the same thing. So once you have that safety net of technique under you, then you can allow yourself to let the real party begin. And what that real party is, I'm reticent to say, <clears throat> because it sounds a bit poncy, yep. but it is in a way channeling. I've heard voices in my head my entire life. I might just be mad if I didn't have puppetry. So with that bedrock of technique in my hands on stage, I'm able to let all those voices come out. And they are real voices, you know, the, the demonic ones are quite harsh and the angelic ones are quite beautiful and you know again it's that thing of I'm seen in the world as a certain kind of guy gregarious mm -hmm. I think um, my favorite characters are the soft ones because I'm never allowed in the real world as a man this age to be that right. vulnerable or sympathetic or sweet. You know, it's just, it doesn't gel with the physical package maybe. So I love those moments when I get a really beautiful, sweet character to perform. 